Welcome to a Prevent Connect podcast, where we explore the prevention of violence against women. This is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Prevention is, is part I, art, part science. Uh, so much of the work that we do trying to prevent sexual violence uh, is really based on kind of artful skills, but science can really help inform that. And the more we bring science to the table, then the better our work can become. The smarter we become, the more effective we'll be. Um, what we're going to talk about in this particular piece, uh, in, in terms of this particular segment, is connecting the dots, and connecting the dots uh, between three different uh, areas. One is emerging discoveries from brain science. Another is the changes that are happening in technology, and then connect that to prevention work, particularly prevention work in the area of sexual exploitation, sexual violence. Um, one of the things that's really happened is that there's really been revolutions in a couple of different spheres. Now, when I say revolutions, uh, I'm not talking about wars or political upheaval. I'm talking about it in the original Latin sense of the word, revolvo, which means to turn upside down. That's where the word revolution comes from. Every once in a while, things come along that really change the world. And we're dealing with some of those. One of the areas where there's been really a revolution is the whole area of brain science. Uh, if I use myself as an example, I got my PhD in psychology back in the psychological dark ages. What I mean by that is that in all of my training at the University of Minnesota, I had one course on the brain. Everything else was behavior, psychology, etc. Today, that's completely changed because as we learn more and more about what happens up here, as we unlock more and more of the secrets, it helps us start to explain a lot of the way uh, attitudes, values, behaviors, it helps us to explain a lot of things. And so my, my profession has really been revolutionized in the past uh, 20 years. And of course, we're also aware that the digital revolution is changing everything that we do. We're using the digital revolution right now in this podcast. Uh, and so the way we communicate, we, the way we entertain ourselves, the way we stay in touch with other people, the way we conduct commerce, it's all happening so fast in this digital internet revolution. Uh, if we blink, it will change. That's how quickly things are changing. So what I'd like to do is see if we can connect the dots between these two uh, fields that are going on in such a revolutionary way and then connect those dots to our work in prevention. If we talk about uh, brain development for just a second or brain functioning, um, a couple of basic principles help us kind of understand things. One is that uh, a basic principle of brain functioning is captured in a little phrase that the neuroscientists like to use, the neurons that fire together, wire together. Now, what's behind that is that this, th this miracle that we carry around on our shoulders is actually a vast electrical system. Right now, every single one of us is generating enough electrical power inside our brain, the equivalent to light, a 25-watt light bulb. All of those brain cells, technically called neurons, are units in that electrical system. And small electrical charges kind of go from one neuron down the cable, shoot out the branches, and then connect to other neurons. As they connect, when those neurons fire, every time that they connect, they get stronger. So the neurons that fire together, the, the neurons that fire together wire together. Another way to say that is that whatever the brain does a lot of is what we get good at. Now, I'll give you an example. I was talking about this actually to a group of third graders not too long ago. And third graders actually enjoy this conversations and they get it. And so we were talking about this and, I, and then I asked the group of third graders, I said, how many of you like sports? And not surprisingly, they all put up their hands. There was a little girl in the front row and I, I looked at her and I said, now tell me, what's your favorite sport? She said, tennis. I said, now that's a great example. I said, now, do you remember when you first started to play tennis? And she kind of smiled, and I asked her what the smile was about. She said, I remember, she said, I could barely hold the racket, and I couldn't even hit the ball. And so I said, well, now you're in third grade. How's your tennis game? She said, well, it's getting pretty good. So I said, well, then how did you get from not even being able to hit the ball to being pretty good? And she looked at me, and she said, well, I practiced. 
I said, absolutely. I said, you are a neuroscientist because the word practice is the English word for the, for the neuroscientific principle, the neurons that fire together, wire together. So whatever we spend a lot of time doing is what we get good at, whether it's tennis, whether it's uh, math in school, or whether it's things like pornography. Um, with, if we take a look at the digital revolution, there are, of course, all sorts of benefits of that revolution, but there's also kind of a seamier side. And one of the seamier sides is the, is the incredible amount of pornography that is now available, not just on our uh, desktops, not just on our laptops, but literally available on our phones. And uh, we don't even have data on how many adolescents, for example, are spending more and more time uh, viewing pornography. We do know that it's a lot more than most people think. Uh, we can't do the research because there isn't a school board in America that will uh, allow students to be questioned about their pornography behavior. But I got a little, uh, I got a little hint of this. Uh, I was doing a workshop not too long ago in a, a suburb of Denver, Colorado. And I was talking about teenagers and internet pornography, and you know we need just need to be aware that this is really a growing issue. And one of the one of the parents taking part in the seminar is a kind of technology geek. He's really good at computers, and in his church community, he's well known uh, for his ability. And so he's become kind of an informal geek squad. So a lot of his church friends, if they're having troubles with their home computer, they'll give him a call and ask if he can come over and take a look. What he told me and the rest of the group that, uh, that evening during that parent seminar, he said, I know what the problem is even before I arrive if they have a teenage boy in the house. I know that the problem is that the computer is being influenced, uh, being affected by viruses which have come in through porn sites. He says it just is almost always true. That gives us a little bit of a hint of how pervasive this, uh, of how widespread this is. Now, if we connect those two dots of the easy availability of internet pornography and the principle of whatever the brain does a lot of is what it gets good at, we start to see those connections and how that that can then start to influence uh, attitudes, values, behaviors. Now, let's talk. Uh, let's talk for a second about the media and technology uh, revolution that is happening. One of the ways to understand the the power of media and technology is through story. Uh, we human beings love stories, always have, always will. Anthropologists tell us that stories are a feature of every culture that they've ever taken a look at. Um, and, and stories are powerful because they don't just entertain and engage us. They're very, very effective at transmitting values from one, from one group to another, from one generation to the next. So whoever tells the stories defines the culture. The power of story hasn't changed. What's changed is who the storytellers are. Because now in the digital revolution, the traditional storytellers are more often pushed to the side, replaced by digital storytellers. Movies, television programs, video games, MySpace, YouTube, and of course, the list keeps, just keeps growing and growing. And even though the, 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 the stories have changed, the power has not diminished. If anything, the power has been amplified because of the reach and because of the high production values that go into these stories. And, and, and of course, these can have a, a beneficial effect. Uh, the, 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 the message, the, the thing that we should remember about the digital technology is that it's powerful. Not that it's good or bad. It's powerful. And because it's powerful, it's capable of benefit, it's also capable of harm. So, for example, one, we, we were talking just a couple minutes ago about pornography. Well, one of the impacts of digital storytellers in terms of pornography is it starts to normalize pornography. But more importantly, it doesn't just normalize pornography, it starts to normalize a lot of the behaviors that are depicted in pornography. So, for example, we have a major uh, national retailer, Abercrombie & Fitch, that uses soft porn as a market, as a sales tool to get kids to buy their clothes. And after a while, that starts to become normal. We have a program like um, 
Friends, which was an NBC ratings hit on uh, at the top of the ratings for nine years. And during the run of that program, the, uh, the girl per, uh, played by Jennifer Aniston, the girl in quotes, the girl next door, was depicted as having multiple sexual partners. Well, if I'm a kid and no one's really talking to me about sex, and I'm spending hours either playing video games like Grand Theft Auto or watching program reruns like Friends when I come home from school, then what do I start to think? I start to think, this is normal. This is what the cool people do. This is what the popular people do. Um, you know, what I'd like to do now is, is, is kind of summarize this with a case study to, to kind of see how bringing, connecting these dots starts to make something which might be a little bit confusing and starts to make it understandable. And the, the example that I'd like to use, and it's just one of dozens and dozens that we could use, is the phenomenon of tech, uh, of, excuse me, of sexting, which as you probably know is sending or receiving uh, sexually explicit uh, messages or photos over the internet. Um, now, one of the things that we, that, that came out in a, uh, for the first time in a study uh, in 2009 was that over a third of the teenagers in the United States have sexted. The surprise in the, uh, the, the surprise in the study was that for a lot of people anyway is that the girls are much more likely to do it than the boys. So how do we make sense of all of this? Well let's take first of all take a look at, at what's going on in the brain. First of all, the teenage brain, just in terms of what's going on in the brain, is not very, very good at risk assessment. Now, the reason for that is actually brain-based. It's not just their lack of experience. The part of our brain where we do risk assessment is right behind our forehead. It's called the prefrontal cortex. That is also the part of the brain that manages emotional impulses and urges. Well, it turns out that that part of the brain is undergoing major construction during the teenage years. And so because of that, teenagers are notoriously not very good at assessing risk. Uh, it's why we sometimes scratch our heads and say, how could such a smart kid do such a stupid thing? It has nothing to do with their thinking brain. It's fine. It's the risk assessment part of their brain, and it's the impulse control center of their brain that's under construction. So first of all, we've got poor risk assessment going on. Secondly, the, the, what's going on in the brain in terms of sexual drive is different between boys and girls. For boys, a part of their brain that is responsible for the, uh, the drive to uh, the interest and drive in terms of the physical aspects of sex actually gets bigger in their brain. Coupled with seven surges of testosterone a day, what that means is that it's normal for a teenage boy to uh, often think, sometimes be obsessed about thoughts about the physical aspects of sex. Um, the girl's brain is a little bit different. Um, that part of her brain does not get bigger. Now that doesn't mean that she's not interested in sex, but it has a different basis driven by two hormones. The key hormone to pay attention to is oxytocin. It's a hormone that increases in her brain but not his. Oxytocin, what I call oxytocin, is the cuddle hormone. It is what is responsible for girls wanting to be close, okay? So now, when we get to, to sexting, one of the things that we found out when we dug into the research is that the reason that the girls are more likely to do it is because the boys are asking them to. And so the reason that they're doing it is because the hormone in their brain is focused on the relationship. See, there's two parts of the sex drive. One is physical, other relational. For boys, capital P physical, small r relational. For girls, just the reverse. So girls, two things are going on. One is that the impulse control center and the risk assessment center are under construction because what we found out is that when we asked the girls, don't you know that once you push that uh, enter button that you lose control over that? They know that then they, they said that they knew that. So then the question is, well, then why did you do, do it? And the, the answer is, because my boyfriend wanted me to. The risk assessment was the short-term risk of, of injuring my relationship with my boyfriend uh, versus the long-term risk. And they, because of the relationship orientation, they didn't want to run that risk. 
And so as we start to kind of put together these these uh, dots to connect these dots, we start to we, we start to understand a little bit what's behind the behavior, and understanding that then can help us make uh, fashion more effective uh, prevention strategies because it's more targeted on what's actually going on inside the minds and the brains of the people that we're, that we're working with. Thank you for listening to this Prevent Connect podcast. Prevent Connect is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views presented on Prevent Connect are not necessarily the views of the United States government, the CDC, or CalCASA. To learn more about Prevent Connect, visit www.preventconnect.org. For more information about CalCASA's mission or to show your support, visit calcasa.org. That's C-A-L-C-A-S-A dot org.